Nothing is an original work, and Warhammer 40k is no exception. There is a myriad of influences that have directly led to the factions that exist in Warhammer 40k today, and I want to go in depth of those influences and see where they actually came from and the lore that is behind each one. Today I'm going to go over Space Marines, the next faction, comment down below on which one you want to see, but for now, let's get into the real lore of Space Marines. The Space Marines are one of the easiest factions to trace their history, solely because of the prominence that the broad term Space Marine has had in the almost 100 years since the term was first used. While the term has been used for that duration, some of the particulars that we can recognize in the modern Astartes still took many years to come to fruition. The idea of a Space Marine is simple. While authors and editors were creating adventures in space, they needed analogies in common parlance so a reader could quickly understand what was happening. To travel in space, you need to be transported from planet to planet. The in-between works similar to the ocean, with the crew not being capable of walking off the ship. So making the analogy of boats and in the military being the navy was easy conceptually for the audience. It sounds silly to us now given that these tropes have existed for most of our lifetimes, but tropes need to start somewhere. Marines in particular have existed as a soldier class since the inception of naval warfare, acting as defenders, landing parties, and high mobility, quick deployment soldiers on shore. So how would you make them science fiction-y? Slap space to the front of them and bam, they fight on alien planets. The term Space Marine was first used in 1932 in a short story by Bob Olson called Captain Brink of the Space Marines. The title was a play on the song Captain Jinx of the Horse Marines. These soldiers would fight missions on Titan, Mars, and Ganymede. Over the following decades, the term would be used for any soldier fighting in space, but wouldn't stray too far from the idea of a simple soldier in basic armor needed to fight in space. That is until Robert A. Heinlein appeared and he had some ideas. Not all of them were great, looking at you strangers in a strange land and the roads must roll. Sex cults are not a form of government and making the entire country on conveyor belts won't work. While Highland had used the term Space Marine in multiple stories, the story that is credited for the current archetype of Space Marines did not call them Space Marines. Instead, they were called the Mobile Infantry and they were doing their part. The story is Starship Troopers. No, not the incredible movie. The novel released in 1959. The tone and style of the novel is significantly different from the movie, so that way you're aware, where the movie is pure, frivolous, campy satire, taking a hard lean on the ineffectiveness of totalitarian regimes and extreme propaganda, the novel is much more serious in its depiction of duty and is often criticized for its glorification of the military. The mobile infantry in the novel were not the standard recruits. Instead, they were equipped with powered armor called M8 Marauder Ape Armor. It's nicknamed the Ape Armor for its elongated arms. This is why the lieutenant says, come on, you apes, you want to live forever in the movie. The armor allowed the soldiers to be rapidly deployed onto a planet from orbit like paratroopers from World War II, skip across the landscape at a rapid pace and engage enemies that were stronger than the average human. This army became the basis for most space marines from there on. The more exploration of space that we conducted in science nonfiction, the more was incorporated into the fiction. Since the vacuum of space was not conducive to human life and all the planets we examined usually didn't have oxygen, a sealed suit made more sense. The harsher the aliens that could potentially exist in the universe, the more we needed to be able to fight against them. From there, the archetype expanded. We still have the normal space marines like the Martian marines from the first season of The Expanse, this is true in the book Leviathan Wakes as well, and in Balasar Galactica, but more marines were usually wearing powered armor, like the Goliath armor from the later season of The Expanse, Spartans in Halo, the Doom Guy, and so on. The idea for augmented soldiers wasn't one that was created by Warhammer 40k either, but that is a little bit more difficult to pin down the exact time for that idea. But even the Space Marines in the first edition of Warhammer 40k weren't augmented. Taking direct inspiration from the Dune series and the Sadakar, Marines were explicitly recruited from feral worlds or as criminals from underhives. Their harsh worlds and warrior cultures produced stronger combatants without the need for augmentation. Over time, this has changed as Space Marines became the face of Warhammer 40k, and they needed to have a slightly more relatable personality. But the initial piece of lore of them being criminals, shoved into their armor to serve their penance, eventually was taken up by the Terran Marines in StarCraft. 
Now you might be thinking that the Primarchs are unique. Demigod sons of the Emperor, leaders of their respective legions, half of them falling to the forces of chaos and leading a bloody war against their father, being called the Angels of the Emperor. Wait, that sounds a little familiar. The entire concept of the Horus Heresy in the Primarchs was a direct parody of Paradise Lost by John Milton. Down the rabbit hole of historical religious fanfiction we go! The Primarchs didn't exist in the first edition of Warhammer 40k, but I think we have established that the first edition is not a good metric for coherent and lasting lore. Instead, Lehman Russ was an Imperial Guard commander, Rebute Gilliman was the first chapter master of the Ultramarines, and others were just kind of spattered here and there and not really too special but they didn't have a direct lineage to the Emperor. It wasn't until the first edition of Adeptus Titanicus that the idea of the Primarchs and the Heresy came to be. You see, Games Workshop wanted to make a game about big robots fighting one another. Their problem was that they didn't have the resources to make two unique factions. They needed to create a narrative reason for two identical factions to be fighting one another so they wouldn't need to make two different model lines entirely. So they decided a trusted commander of the Emperor had started a civil war. His name, Horus Warhammer 40k, I mean Lupercal. Since the religious allegories were already abound for the Emperor, Rick Priestley made the decision to further that by parodying Paradise Loss. It also served as an influence for the forces of chaos, but more on that in another time. Although the main narrative thrust of Paradise Lost doesn't actually talk about the war, it does go in detail as this story goes along. The main story of Paradise Lost is Lucifer tempting Adam and Eve after he has fallen. The war that actually culminated in Lucifer's banishment to hell was actually because he was, well, had daddy issues essentially. God had created Jesus and had begun to make his new world with earth and the humans, and Lucifer, who was the big man on top, he was the one that was actually God's favorite, felt like it was being imposed. He had the big brother syndrome with the younger brother being more loved than him. So he decided with his rhetoric to bring half the angels in heaven on his side to rebel against God, who he saw as tyrannical and leading against the actual good of what he thought. The angels should be the ones on top. This war went pretty much as you would expect. He had made his way all the way to heaven. And as soon as he had made it to heaven, Jesus came down, kind of smashed him down. And then all of the angels were banished completely to hell. Now you do have Lucifer after the fall seeking to corrupt God's perfect realm, which you do have a little bit as the general gist of what's going on in 40K. Chaos is slowly corrupting the entire realm that exists for, that the emperor had created after the great crusade. But it doesn't quite fit because Lucifer allegory Horus doesn't exist anymore and it is just his son Abaddon that is out there doing his dark crusades. Now, as with a lot of the original intentions in that lore that was created during 1st and 2nd edition as well as Adeptus Titanicus, this exact reading has been lost with expansion. I don't think there is really a direct analogy for Paradise Lost in Erebus or a lot of the other expansions that have gone on for the Horus Heresy and all of the general Primarchs in those as a whole. Those were a expansion of requirements. They wanted to have legions that had leaders and then expand on there, make them evenly the dark angels versus the angels of the emperor himself. That gives you a bit of an idea of where the space marines came from, the influences that have led to them, and where the influences have gone to when they originally started. If you like this, like and comment, subscribe, tell me a little bit about the factions that you want to hear more about and the influences that have led to it. I might do a larger one on Warhammer 40k in general and the different stories that led to it like Dune and the Foundation series. For now, that's all.